Today's episode is sponsored by Wells Fargo Advisors Financial Network, Finet, member SIPC. Finet is focused on helping independent advisors support their clients and reach their goals with unique, ever-evolving solutions and resources from one of the nation's largest financial institutions. Learn how you can get more with Finet at wfa.com slash independent. That's wfa.com slash independent. Welcome to the Wellstack Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Rosick, the Director of Wellstack Content Solutions. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Ross Riskin, Founder and Chief Creative at VisiWealth. Today's topic, the power of using visuals to simplify complex topics to stimulate meaningful conversations with clients. Ross, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Super excited to be here. So this has obviously become a very popular topic, um, whether it's around advice engagement, using visuals to engage clients around complex topics. But, you know, before we get into those, I will say, I guess, hard hitting questions, or maybe this is the hardest question, depending on how you look at it. I do want to start with your background and how you ultimately landed where you are today. Well, I definitely think that is the hardest question. I was I was just thinking about that before coming on here. And, you know, this actually marks my 10 year anniversary being a CPA, and it's actually 10 years since I gave my first presentation actually at an event. I remember it was 10 years ago. I presented at a conference for new directors, partners, and principals at Deloitte in Henderson, Nevada. And so I had time to kind of really reflect on that. And I've had a great journey, although it's been uh, a short and quick one. I started out uh, as a CPA at Deloitte, got my master's in taxation, and then quickly moved my way into academia. So back in 2015, I took on a role uh, being a professor of accounting and finance at a small private liberal arts college here in Connecticut. And I started the first baccalaureate CFP program there, did a lot of stuff with the AICPA, got involved there. And since then, I've been involved in advisor education, acted as a professor recently at the American College of Financial Services, and most recently took on the role of chief learning officer at the Investments and Wealth Institute. So I've always had one foot in academia, one foot in the conference speaking circuit, and then one foot in practice, actually working with clients as a CPA financial planner. And as you mentioned in the intro, VisiWealth is the latest thing that I've been working on. I've been really passionate about of really putting putting or pulling everything together uh, of what I've been doing for the last decade in my career. Well, congratulations on the 10-year milestone. That's very exciting. But maybe we should pivot and talk about work-life balance. How in the world do you have time to do all this and be passionate about all of it? (laughs) That is a great question, one I am still trying to figure out. Um, I've convinced, I've either lied to myself or convinced myself that I'm able to do it because there's so much synergy in what I do. I mean, I've been getting that question for probably the past seven or eight years of, how are you doing this? How are you working in a CPA practice and running an RA firm and teaching as a full-time faculty member with a 4-4 load? And I've convinced myself it's because I'm teaching what I do with clients, right? It's, hey, if I'm working, doing a tax planning projection with a client, I'm then going at night and teaching up-and-coming advisors, up-and-coming accountants and CPAs how to do that with clients. So I think that's been a way that I've been able to manage doing so many things is because there's just so many similarities, so many synergies, kind of that, you know, write once and then just publish out as many times as possible, different outlets, different distribution channels. Uh, I'm just doing it in a way that's a little more unique or, or a way that's not really popular that other people do it. And it's probably for good reason. Uh, it's not necessarily something to be modeled after. <laughs> well, as long as you're getting at least a couple hours sleep a night, right? I am. And it's, it's very funny because I'm still getting sleep. My wife and I, we have a 16 month old daughter and she is a great sleeper. And I can't tell anybody that, that I know that has young children because then they really won't talk to me or talk to us, but yes, yeah, sleep is essential. Uh, <laughs> I'll just say that. Uh-huh. Well, you're doing it all very impressive. But, you know, before we dive into our first segment, obviously, VisiWealth has been categorized by the Michael Kitsis FinTech map as an advice engagement firm. So just to really set the stage, you know, what does advice engagement mean to you? And why is it important in wealth management? It is a category that's obviously exploded as of late. Yeah, great question. I mean, for me, advice engagement, it's really synonymous with learner engagement. 
right? And we have the research, we have the data, we have the studies to know that engagement in the classroom is tied to better learner performance, higher learner confidence levels, and increased student satisfaction. So it's almost logical that if we focus on engagement with clients and prospects, that we as planners, as wealth management professionals, can really deliver planning experiences that are deemed to be valuable, understandable, and maybe most importantly, enjoyable for clients, right? That's like one thing we don't always talk about is a lot of people dread going and talking with an advisor or dread talking about money or dread talking to their CPA. But if we can really focus on the engagement aspect, we can deliver a lot of value uh, for our clients. So that's really what I've been focused on on the VisiWealth side of things. Uh, you mentioned before, you know, being on the Kitsis platform and the Kitsis map, we made it there very quickly. But as I alluded to before, it's something I've been working on for a decade. It's just stuff I've been doing both in the classroom with traditional students, talking at top conferences, working with clients. The one thing that's really resonated with everyone is really this concept around the use of visuals uh, in, a, in a creative and really engaging manner. Well, creative and financial planning are two words and terminologies that you don't always hear together. So with that, I do want to dive into our first segment, uh, Stats All Folks. We're obviously talking about the importance of visuals to tell a story and break down complex topics. And both short-term and long-term memory store information is in chunks, but the former can really be limited. And, you know, one of the easiest ways, and at least I know for me too, to ensure that learners store information and long-term memory is to, again, pair those concepts with meaningful images. And, you know, according to a study conducted by MIT, 90% of information transmitted to the brain is visual and visuals are processed. I think it's somewhere around like 60,000 times faster in the brain than text. So please put this into context when it comes to the importance of visuals uh, in wealth management. Yeah, Shannon, I love those stats. And it's, it's so important to focus on that because our ability to recall and retain and absorb information in a visual manner is just so much more advanced than our ability to do it on a verbal basis alone of just reading text. And that's because of this thing that's been referenced as the picture superiority complex, right? So when you're actually looking at a visual, there's two things going on. One thing that goes on is you actually have the verbal code gets embedded into your brain, but then you have the visual image there as well. And so we're able to just recall that information more quickly, more vividly, as opposed to just reading something where we're still reading a letter at a time. Even if you're a speed reader and you go through and you think you can absorb the information, the brain still processes multiple visuals in a much quicker fashion. And if we really take a step back and think about, well, what's the impact of that? You know, big picture, what are we doing as advisors, as wealth management professionals? We are really focused on helping individuals make smarter, better financial decisions, or we're trying to gain the trust of those individuals to allow us to do that for them. And so in order to build that trust, it really comes back to education, right? We need to either educate people to make better decisions or educate them in a manner that they trust us uh, with making those tough decisions where there, there, are big, there can be big consequences if we get something wrong. So what's the importance of the visuals? It really comes back to learner engagement, right? And so there will be things thrown out there like, we'll hear the terms uh, learning styles, right? And oh, I'm a visual learner. And so that's one thing I just wanted to point out. If we ever hear the term learning styles, learning styles do not exist. So that's a myth out there. So what people often refer to as learning styles are really learning preferences. So a lot of people are visual learners. They prefer to learn visually. And so that's really important, especially if we're trying to figure out what's the best way to deliver information to a client. What's the best way they're going to absorb it? The issue with that is just because someone prefers to receive information that way doesn't mean it's actually the best way to learn, right? I mean, the best example is if you encounter somebody who tells you, you know, I'm, a, I'm, an audit, I'm an auditory learner. I like to listen to podcasts, in the car, a train, whatever. But the reality is, even if that's the way you prefer to learn, you're not going to learn how to drive a car the best by listening to a podcast or listen to somebody instruct you on how to drive a vehicle. So that's why we often confuse those or conflate the term styles, but it's really the learning preferences, but that's important. And that's what we need to figure out. What is the preferred way our clients wish to receive information and can we deliver it in multiple modalities? And one other part I wanted to mention that I think is so important is really on the other side of things. I want to reference this great study that was done back in 2021 by uh, Lertz, Kothakota, 
Heckman and Archuleta, and it's called The Effect of Risk Literacy and Visual Aids on Portfolio Choices Among Professional Financial Planners. And what they wanted to do there is they wanted to see, hey, look, amongst both CFPs and non-CFPs, does their risk literacy level and or the use of being presented with visual aids help them make better choices or help them make the correct portfolio choice for a client in a hypothetical scenario? And they found that there's no difference between CFPs and non-CFPs, that both groups have really high risk literacy levels. The only factor that was statistically significant was whether a visual aid was used in the questioning or not. So another way to think about that is the study suggests that visuals actually help advisors make better decisions as well, which that's incredible, right? So it's not even about this, what are we putting in front of clients to engage with them? But the research is suggesting that the advisors are actually better and making better decisions if they've used visuals or been presented to visuals themselves in their own analysis before presenting to a client. So I think that part is just super fascinating. Wow. Well, there's obviously a lot to unpack there. <laughs> I I learned something new immediately just between learning styles and learning preferences. So thank you for the myth buster <laughs> there. But that is really interesting. And obviously it's no secret that dealing with money is, you know, one of the most sensitive subjects we can talk about. And, you know, especially investors are always told to leave the emotion out of major financial decisions. But, you know, that's difficult for a lot of folks at the end of the day. And you know, visuals can actually trigger strong emotions in us. And we often tend to remember the pairing of emotions and visuals and, and vivid details. So, you know, visuals that engage us emotionally can dramatically, like, as you mentioned, improve our learning outcomes. So would you say there's an argument to be made that maybe some emotion is okay when it comes to advisors, you know, engaging clients on more complex topic, topics or sensitive subjects? So I wouldn't say that it's okay. I would say that it's necessary. And there's really two ways to look at it or think about it. One is how can we evoke emotion within the visual itself, within the construction of what are we putting into the visual? And the second is how can we evoke emotion with how are we presenting a visual to a client or to a prospect? So the first example, if we think about it, well, what's actually going on in visual? So there was another interesting study that was done uh, I believe it was Allianz that actually did it, where they use this AI tool where they would allow clients to upload pictures of themselves. And then a tool would be used to create examples of, hey, what would your future self look like if you had this much money in retirement or a successful outcome versus a non-successful outcome? And they actually found that people who saw a version of themselves happier or smiling were actually more likely to commit to those financial decisions that led to better outcomes later on in life. And so that's a thing. Whenever I see visuals where it's maybe a stick figure or it's a picture of a face where even if there's a smile but no eyes, we look at those things. We may think, oh, that doesn't really matter, but it actually does matter. That's why a lot of the visuals we create, if there's ever people involved in them or cartoons of people, we're always having emotion on the face because people actually connect with that. It's in a way helping them see a version of their future selves leads to better, uh, more immediate decision-making now. The second piece is on that evoking emotion with how do you actually present things? And this is something I'm really focused on, especially on in the part when we're talking about, well, how do you actually deliver these things to clients? And so that's one of the cool things that we're doing at VisaWealth is I'm sure you've seen, and even the audience has seen some of our visuals out there, the one-page simple PDFs. But another great deliverable we have are one-page concept presentations, which these are those same visuals in PowerPoint format, where we actually have the animations built in where we can control what information gets revealed. And that is critically important, right? I'm sure you're, you've, you're like me, where you've been to presentations at conferences and you've seen it where there's 18 bullet points on the screen and they're all revealed at the same time. And you're struggling to what number are they on and you're reading instead of listening. But that is such an important thing to focus on as an advisor, especially in a one-on-one -on -one setting with a client or prospect of, I need to be able to control this person's attention which then allows me to pause and reflect, especially if you're an advisor and you're going through some of the more technical, but also emotionally draining concepts around estate planning, right? Around mortality of, hey, if you pass away, here's what happens to your money of being able to show an example, but then pause and see what the response is from the client and then engage in other conversations there. 
So long story short, the emotion part is definitely a key piece in both the building of visuals or what you create, but then also it's key to do whatever you can to evoke some emotion out of your clients when you're delivering visual aids and using visual examples with them. Well, I'm certainly stealing some of these ideas next time I give presentations or moderate a panel. So thank you for that. And, you know, I will say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, no, you know, one other tip I'll give one thing I saw, I remember at a presentation a while ago, and it, it was a, it was a tip that was given that it stuck with me. I, I am at, I fall or blame myself, even though I know it's a great strategy, I still fail to use it, but it's the power of the pause. And so what I've noticed is some of the best presentations, if you're getting ready to tell a really meaningful story, the best thing you can do as a presenter is turn the screen black. Because then that allows the audience to actually focus on you and what you're talking about instead of staring at whatever the last slide was, whatever is up there. So that's tied to this idea of the power of the pause. So that's another tip for you. All right. So moving forward, no presentations, just a blank screen. Got it. No, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's it's very clear that your passion for education is is evident, everything that you do. But with investors having so much access to information now, you know, robos, the the rise of, you know, kind of self-directed plans and investors just being savvier all around, you know, how critical is it for advisors to offer educational support and visual tools throughout the planning process to clients? Is this also something that clients should be asking for? Because it is a relatively newer concept. And do you see this potentially being a differentiator as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's critically important. I think if we go back and think about it, our clients, regardless of age, demographics, uh, income level, wealth level, they're all lifelong learners. So everybody is craving or desiring some sort of education on some level. And to your point, right, we have we have better access to more information than we ever have, while at the same time, our attention spans are shorter. It's tough to differentiate what's accurate and what's inaccurate. And a lot of information is being fed to us that appears to be inaccurate, but there's also no accountability tied back to it, right? Of, hey, if I listen to that and it's wrong, is that a person who told me that, that I know and I can not follow them or not engage them again, or can I report them? So there's all those things going on, which is why it's really important for advisors to really focus on the educational aspect because Next-gen clients in particular and younger clients are craving that, right? They are the ones who are on YouTube all the time of looking at DIY things and tutorial videos and how do I do this and how do I life hack certain things. So they're already expecting that and they're getting information delivered to them. So if you can pair that or if you can deliver that as an advisor who is, you know, competent and you're credentialed, like it's a win-win and it's going to become really table stakes that you do as an advisor. It's also another example of how you can deliver content on a one-to-many approach, right? So listeners may be familiar with the Kitsis service model, uh, you know, discussions around that of, hey, it's easier to show value if you really break out what you're delivering. And maybe every quarter you're doing an educational event where it's one presentation, but you get to deliver it to your entire client base. So I think it is extremely, uh, it's, it's extremely important to really focus on that. And, you know, if I could say like, you know, you mentioned with tools and robos and it's, I think it's something where, you know, tools and technology really should be used to help make us more efficient and make us think smarter, not distract us and make us think less. And I think that's really the differentiator here is every, you know, every day, every hour, there's something new coming out about some generative AI bot or something else. But I also can't help but wonder the amount of people that are, you're so distracted by that of like, you're waiting for the next thing to come out that you're not even doing the job or task in front of you. And I think tech really should be, tech should not be seen as the deliverable. The real deliverable is you, the advisor. It's the human element. And I think that is kind of the good thing. And that is what's going to end up being the differentiator is not going to be who has this tech suite or who's using this tool. Everyone's going to be using a lot of the same stuff. I mean, in another vein, in the I'll tell you, in the next five, prob yeah, three to five years, I'd say, everyone's website is going to look the same. Oh, yeah. There's going to be virtually no, <laughs> no differences in anyone's <laughs> website. So it's all going to come back to you as an individual, you as a person. So I think that is... Uh, we need to use technology uh, to help us get better and think more and be more agile. 
Um, and then I think it's, you know, something also to keep in mind is, you know, if there's this idea of, well, do we rely too much on technology? Like to some degree we do, right? Like we all rely on that. No one, you know, my father even still asks me, he's like, oh, when you're coming to the house, turn on this street. I'm like, I have, I have no idea what street you're talking about, even though I drove that for, you know, 20 years <laughs> growing up. So we're all so reliant on those things, but I think we have to guard against that and be careful of not being over-reliant. And we really need to focus on being self-reliant, right? Of being prepared if a system breaks down, if a technology doesn't work, do you at least know what questions to ask? How do you fix it? How do you still deliver the same great service that your clients expect from you? So just some thoughts there. Uh, no, I, I completely agree. And, and I go back to your first comment around this question around attention spans. And I forget which study it was, but we have less of an attention span than of a goldfish, which is like 8.8 .8 seconds. Humans are 7.4 seconds. <laughs> Not sure what that says about the state of humanity, but kind of going back to your point of technology being the enabler to deliver this and ultimately, you know, help advisors differentiate to capture, uh, you know, th those moments with clients, knowing that because we, I, I like to use the jelly donut analogy. It just feels like our brains are constantly just kind of being like pumped full of jelly because of all the information available out there. It's insane. So, you know, if advisors can utilize things like visuals to capture that moment in time, you know, with their clients, that's huge. What a big differentiator and how memorable for the client to say, gosh, I never really considered this, but the way they're able to break this down for me and explain it in layman's terms, it's going to go such a long way. And it kind of goes back to this overarching theme in our industry of democratization, right? Of, mm -hmm. of advice. So it, it is encouraging to see that, that things like this have really come to fruition in the last few years. Yeah, I know you're so right. And, it, and a lot of the focus turns to the personalization aspect as well. And that's really something that you know, one of my ultimate goals is I want financial professionals to become more education focused. Like they really are educators. You, they are educators, teachers, private tutors, whatever you want to classify it as. They're in such a good position to do that. And we know the best educators are able to deliver those personalized experiences. But the advisor has a major advantage because if I take a step back and I put myself back a couple of years ago into a, a, a graduate school classroom, I walk into the classroom and I'm teaching some people who just graduated undergrad that they're, you know, they're doing their fifth year in accounting. And then I have adult learners who are coming back. They're working, they have families who are supporting them coming back part-time all over the spectrum, as far as where people's knowledge bases are, their performance level, how they learn best. But the best teachers are able to walk into that environment and identify, hey, here's the 70% of the class that I know I need to present them this way because it keeps them on track. Then I can spend 15% with the people who need that extra attention, extra examples to go through. And then I have the 15% that have been done for 30 minutes and they're bored of how do I provide them with extended learning opportunities, right? So like that is what is going through the mind of an educator and teacher every single day they go into the classroom. And as an advisor, you're one-on-one -on -one with one client. So you need to be focused on picking up on those cues to really understand their learning preferences and what resonates them and what doesn't and what emotions are they displaying to you because you're you're having that benefit of a one-on-one -on -one relationship that should enable you to provide just an incredible personalized tailored experience for clients. And I've heard you mention the three C's that advisors should really focus on for success in the future. And for those that don't know, what are they? Great. Well, I had to talk about this because I listened to your podcast the other day with Adam and he mentioned, what is it? The six L's Yep. he had, right? So I got a, I obviously not going to go more than six. So I'm going the opposite <laughs> way with numbers, but no, the three C's are in order to be successful for the future, you need to be able to do these three things. The first is demonstrate comprehension. This is why advisors need to be focused on advanced degrees, designations, continuing education, because you need to comprehend what you're talking about before you can go talk to clients and prospects about it, right? Comprehension is key. The second piece is you need to be able to operationalize your curation process. Like we are very good curators of content, or at least we should be, right? Of we're subscribe, you know, we're members of these associations. I subscribe to these periodicals and I 
I follow this podcast and this thought leader. I'm getting all this information. I know where to pull really good content from, but do we have a system to operationalize that where I know, hey, if something comes out on a new tax law change, I'm going here, I'm pulling it into the system. It's being categorized this way and now it goes out to my clients. Now, one of the problems with that is even if we have good curation systems in place, it either requires us going out to external resources, which you don't have a consistency factor there, right? Maybe you pull this great visual from VisaWealth and then you pull something else from the JP Morgan Advisor's Guide to the Market, which is great, but you're not delivering a consistent experience. Or if you want to build everything in-house, that's just costly and time, time consuming to actually do that. So we still need to have that curation system in place. And then the final one is really being able to deliver on the communication side of things. So I love the show Mad Men. And, you know, one of the most famous quotes by Don Draper, he says, you know, if you don't like what's being said, change the conversation. And I would argue that if people don't understand what's being said, there is no conversation because you cannot be an effective receiver of knowledge without comprehension, without understanding. And you can't be an effective giver of knowledge if you don't know where people are at. So those are those three things of the focus on comprehension, focus of curation and focus on communication are really three things that are going to allow advisors to be very successful, stand out from the crowd and always be thinking about things and be better prepared for changing environments, which as you could see, it's changing not even every day, every hour, something is changing. So you just need to equip yourself, to be ready to handle the change. Well, you read my mind for my next question because I was going to ask about the role of communication skills when fostering, you know, advice engagement conversation and effective strategies for communicating with maybe say those less engaged clients. So I'm going to pivot a little bit and ask, you know, what are the core areas of the planning process then where advice engagement strategies can be applied? Obviously, communication is a big part of it, but specifically when you look at the whole planning process, you know, how do you break that down and how do you reconcile that when it comes to advice engagement? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's it's really going to differ from practice to practice. But if I take a step back and I think about like the seven step CFP planning process, right? I think where it becomes very evident or clear is on the front end, right? In the kind of quantifying goals, uh, classifying goals, identifying the needs and wants of a client. Those are those are good. And that's that's the part where you can, use and should be using advice engagement because the prompt for that is usually someone coming to you with a question, right? It's somebody coming to you saying, I have a, a kid and they're going to be going to college next year. I don't know how we're going to pay for this, right? Like that is, that is usually one of the questions that comes up early. So there's moments to deliver advice in an engaging manner up front. And so I think at least what we're doing at VisaWealth with kind of what we're building on the visual side of things, we found most success in conversations with existing clients, but in also being able to answer questions for prospects. I think that's something that is, we, we exert, we either exert so much time, effort, and energy on building out things that are customized for prospects, or we make the process of just allowing them to give us information. The, the barrier is so high to that, that people don't want to go through and fill out a long form questionnaire or go through five or six pages of that. They've moved on, right? You just talked about the intention span of a goldfish, like they're gone. So that's why the beauty of if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I keep hearing about, um, uh, you know, doing a Roth conversion, like, is that something I should do? We all know we have the tools and planning software where that's going to depend on every client situation. But how great is it that I can pull up a visual real quick and engage in an educational moment to be like, hey, look, if you come on board as a client, we'll do a detailed analysis for you. But let me actually talk about some of the important planning points uh, that we need to take into consideration if you're considering do a, doing a conversion. Then I can go through a visual example and take a couple of minutes. I've collected no information from the client. I've demonstrated my ability, uh, my comprehension, I've demonstrated to them of the, of the subject matter. And I've educated them. I didn't sell them anything. What I sold them was my service and my knowledge and that they can trust me that, oh, there is more to this than that article I read or someone at work mentioned that, hey, it may make sense for me to work with you. So I think definitely on the front end of a planning engagement, when you're actually getting someone comfortable if they want to work with you or not, and then definitely in the later stages of the process, in the uh, in the presenting recommendations, right? Of like when you're actually done putting a plan together and you have recommendations, you want people to buy into them. 
how are you educating them that like, what are you showing them? Hopefully you're not still showing them a 50 page analysis oh gosh, for the report yes. and like diving <laughs> into that, but you're getting right to the point. But at the same time, being able to use examples that help visualize what is going on. And then obviously the monitoring aspect of it. Right. And that's something where some advisors, you know, I think are definitely under delivering when it comes to the monitoring, right? Maybe we're still doing a quarterly call where we just send a portfolio statement or just check in once in a while, but being able to grab a visual of, Hey, look, a new tax law change is being proposed or just came out and just being able to send an email and say, Hey, look, there's a new strategy here. I'm looking into whether or not it's going to apply in your case, but either way, I'm, I'm thinking of you with, with this in mind, if it's going to apply or not. And we can spend a couple minutes and I'll tell you about it. It may not apply at all, but I'm being proactive. And that resonates with clients. It's the same reason why I've been such a proponent and so passionate about education planning and student loan planning, because for clients with children, it's all about legacy. Whether they tell you that up front or not, it is all about their kids and making sure their kids are set up for success and that any wealth that's been generated or accumulated isn't dissipated <laughs> immediately and that their kids are taken care of or set up to be positioned for success in the future, which is why when you call a client and say, hey, something's happening with 529 plans or student loans or something happening, even if it doesn't apply to their case, what they are hearing is, wow, my advisor is calling me asking about my son or daughter. That's what they're hearing. And that's what's resonating and sticking with people. So I will say every practice is a little different, but we definitely see the use of advice engagement earlier on in the process. Then when presenting recommendations to clients and then the ongoing monitoring, there's so many different opportunities. I mean, you know, one other example I'll give with that is if we just think about even outside of the planning process and the planning engagement, clients are receiving a tax return, right? Usually they're getting a 1040 that they're scared. They probably don't even open, even look at it. They're scared. It's black and white numbers all over the place. Not very visual. Those are opportunities where it's great to use visuals to explain, hey, what's actually going on in your tax return? A trust document, an even more intimidating and confusing document that no one is reading, no client is actually reading through. Here are some visuals to explain why we chose this trust to set up and how it actually works, you know, should you pass away, become incapacitated. Financial aid award letters. Hey, I thought those were all grants and scholarships I received. No, they're actually loans. And here's the loan repayment strategies that we need to be talking about. And even the portfolio reportments, a social security statement, right? Clients are receiving all these other things. So it's really, it's really on the advisor to be aware of those other things. Because even if we get it right, of uh, hey, the way we deliver advice and our plan here, there's those other moments where the client is being bombarded that their CPA, their attorney, their insurance professional, whoever, they may not be communicating to them in a way that's conducive to their learning. They may not be delivering at the same level that you are. So those are just additional opportunities for you to create educational moments that matter and add value for clients. Well, great advice. So I have to ask before we go to our next segment, what's on the roadmap for Busy Wealth? You know, what does advice engagement, I guess, 2.0 look like? Re really excited. So a lot of stuff going on. So, you know, we're really focusing on some tech upgrades, enhanced white labeling features. We know that's really important for the smaller solo advisors, RIA type firms wanting that, uh, adding some additional partnerships and integrations. We just released an awesome stencil with Asset Map that we're super pumped about. And that's that's also the really cool thing about what we're building is even though we're in that advice engagement fintech space, we're really building a library of great content that can fit and plug and play into whatever platforms you're using. So that's another cool thing. And then adding a community element in the future. So it'll be easier for advisors to engage. Hey, how are you using this visual? Or what are you using with your clients? What have you had success with to get that communal aspect? And then finally, the explainer videos, right? So we have the one page PDFs, we have the PowerPoint presentations, we have the written key takeaways. And so to wrap everything up from a multimodal perspective are going to be those, you know, three to seven minute videos of me and other subject matter experts, not only explaining what is going on in these visuals, but taking the time to provide tips and suggestions of, hey, if you're going to present a visual about a charitable remainder trust to a client, here's how you should do it. You should go through this and then pause and then prompt this question. So it's a combination of that advisor education and also practice management all in one. So we're super excited. And that's all coming up kind of in the next, you know, couple months, definitely through the remainder of 2023. 
All right. Well, we'll have to do a follow-up episode where it's where we do video at some point and, and, yes. and loop in all the visual aspects. But uh, I do want to get to segment two of this episode, Ross, which is ask us anything. And I've gone out to the social universe and asked them to submit questions they want answered by you. So we did have a few folks drop into the DMs this week with the first question being, what are some common misconceptions about advice engagement and how can advisors overcome them? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I see it with two extremes. I think either some advisors still don't even know what it is. I, <laughs> I think yep. is, is kind of one of the misconceptions. What is this? And then the other side is they, they maybe get bombarded because I think they're starting to see the map is growing in that space. And there's all these new players and are these all tech companies? Do they, do they talk to one another? Is there a big learning curve? Do I have to now redo what I have to do? And it really isn't that. I think the beauty about this space and advice engagement is it's all really focused on human-centered, human-delivered advice. So all the tools that are out there from Bento to Asimap, Pathfinder, even though they're using technology in some amazing ways, it's also that you as an advisor can focus on your client and your client understands that they're working with you. They're not working with the tools that you're actually using. And in a similar vein, we had another question what advice would you give to advisors who are looking to improve their advice engagement strategies and outcomes? Not loaded or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. I'd say that we tend to overvalue what we don't have and undervalue what we have. And so that points back again to clients are working with you for a reason, right? It's they're resonating with you, your ability to communicate with them your ability to form deep relationships and deep connections. So I think advisors need to take a step back and self-reflect and think about what makes me so great? What makes me the person that my clients want to work with? How can I be better? And then look and see, well, what tools are out there that I can use to help me reach that next step? Help me reach that goal. Help me get better. We're always in this continuous state of improvement and we need to be. And then the other thing I'll say is, don't be afraid to try new things. I think if you fall into this pattern of never trying new things, now we're back to the other thing we were talking about with that over-reliance of, hey, I'm just relying on these things. I've always used it. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna put the blinders up, allegory of the cave, and I'm not gonna look outside and in, in, in the other environment, actually see what's going on. So always you wanna, you know, I used allegory of the cave there. One thing I forgot to mention in the beginning is I love using you know, literature or pop culture or movie references wherever possible. But one of my favorite movies, 1986, Aliens, Stay Frosty. That's it. That's what you have to do. You have to be alert at all times. You have to know what's on the horizon, what's a distraction, what's not. Don't be afraid to try things. Just really guard and protect your time because uh, it's an exciting time to be alive as an advisor and really engage with clients and do some really cool things in creative ways for clients. All right. So our next project, we have to write a little book of vignettes with, um, you know, all sorts of analogies and movie quotes because I'm <laughs> the same boat as you. <laughs> but yes. I, I do appreciate you being put on the spot and your insightful answers. But we have come to our final and my favorite segment, uh, Stack It or Whack It, where I'm going to throw out a few technologies, not always necessarily wealth tech related. And you tell me if they are worth the hype or not. And so I know you being an educator and you're on top of trends constantly that are happening within our industry. I have to ask about direct indexing. It's been in the headlines uh, for years now, and it's kind of its current state and where we are now with it and, it, you know, investor demand for it. Stack it or whack it? I'm going to say whack it. And then I also forgot to ask, I'm not providing any rationale for any of my responses in this part. Whack it. I respect that. All right. Fair enough. And so number two, not necessarily a technology, but I had to loop this in since we're both from Connecticut, you know, and I, and now that I live in Denver, I miss pizza, bagels, and bodegas. So Frank Pepe's in Fairfield, if you've been, I hope you have, if <laughs> it's the stack it or whack it in terms of pizza. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get a lot of whack for this one. I'm going to say stack it. Okay. <laughs> I, I like it, but the purists do not. So if you are from Connecticut and you've had the New Haven Pepe's pizza, you'll probably never talk to me again. But if you have never been to Connecticut and you go there, it's still better than anything else you've had outside of the state. I will, I will say that. 
All right. I think that's that's a fair rationale right there. <laughs> well, the fun way to to wrap up, Ross, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, feel free to tell listeners where they can find out more about how to connect with you and what's happening at VisiWealth. Sure. Well, people can follow me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm most active in the social channels. They can also check out visiwealth.org. That's V-I-S-I wealth.org. Or they can even go to my own site, rossriskin.com. Check out what else I'm doing with the Investments and in Wealth Institute, the AICCFC, where I'm uh, speaking at other conferences coming up and happy to engage on LinkedIn and shoot me an email if you have questions. Awesome. Well, appreciate your time and be sure to like and subscribe to the WealthStack podcast on all major podcasting platforms and follow all things WealthStack on wealthmanagement.com, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you all for tuning in today. Today's episode is sponsored by Wells Fargo Advisors Financial Network, Finet, member SIPC. Finet is focused on helping independent advisors support their clients and reach their goals with unique, ever-evolving solutions and resources from one of the nation's largest financial institutions. Learn how you can get more with Finet at wfa.com independent. That's wfa.com independent.